mid-1980s, a curious arc had been observed near one of the furthest ever galaxy clusters. This cluster, identified by George Abel in 1958, and its curious glowing arc, would go on to become one of the most important objects in astrophysics and cosmology. In fact, this cluster appeared to be hiding among several arcs of light. But as closer observations of Abel 370 were taken throughout the 80s and 90s and then the 2000s, this primary illuminated arc had taken on the appearance of a dragon. Once the powerful Hubble Space Telescope, or HST, had been commissioned in the early 90s, it was quickly used to train its steady eye on Abel 370 in the hopes of resolving this mysterious streak of light. After tens of hours, the dragon's head was resolved, and it emerged as a single background spiral galaxy amplified and perfectly focused by the massive Abel cluster its light was traveling through. It was then realized its body and tail were duplicate images of the same distant spiral galaxy with other galaxies dotted among it. Long before the HST could see such things, Albert Einstein had predicted back in 1912 that the gravity of massive starry objects distorts the space-time field they exist within and thus could bend light traveling through them to create such an illusion. Later, he and others thought if only humanity could create telescope lenses large enough and smooth enough to observe light from these distant regions of the early universe, we might be able to witness them. As the spectrum of light from Abel 370 was analyzed, it was found to be located at a redshift, or Z, of 0.375, which means that it was coming from over 5 billion light years away. But maybe the more stunning fact about Abel 370 is that the dragon was also measured and its redshift was found to be very different from the cluster. The dragon arc was in fact a mirage, an image of a faint source located far behind and far earlier in the universe than Abel 370. This was a source much too faint to have ever been detected by Hubble without the fortunate effect of gravitational lensing. The spectrum of the giant arc was revealed to be at a redshift of 0.724. This meant that piercing through the curved spacetime around the massive cluster is the focused image of a galaxy twice as far into the recesses of the universe as the cluster itself. In 2014, the HST would again train its eye towards Abel 370's phenomenal demonstration of Einstein's theory that there exists a gravitational tethering between light, space, and time. As the final cluster to be imaged in the Frontier Fields program using 630 hours over 560 orbits around Earth, Hubble peered across 6 billion light years of space to capture Abel 370 in new, unprecedented resolution and stunning detail. The brightest and largest galaxies in the cluster are yellow, white, They're massive elliptical galaxies containing many hundreds of billions of stars each. The spiral galaxies, with their distinct bright blue arms, 
like our own Milky Way and what the dragon itself is made of, often include younger populations of stars, bluer before, after billions of years, they age into the more yellow, orange color, characteristic of older stars and generally more ancient galaxies. But with such extensive observation time, Hubble was also able to resolve extremely faint features of the galaxy cluster that it hadn't seen before. Abel 370's enormous gravitational influence warps the shape of space-time around it, causing the light of background galaxies to spread out along multiple paths and arcs and appear distorted and magnified. The lensed background galaxies turn into a series of streaks curving around the center of the image, the center of mass of the cluster itself. Abel 370 is just one of thousands of massive galaxy clusters hiding in the dark depths of space. They act like natural telescopes, giving astronomers a glimpse of the universe in its infancy, sometimes only a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. Entangled among the four ground galaxies are as many as a hundred mysterious looking arcs of blue light that are themselves the distant galaxies behind it now resolved in this cluster. Many of them have duplicates caused by this lensing effect. This image shows how powerful Hubble can be at probing for remote galaxies that inhabited the early universe. The active research into dark matter is significantly boosted by clusters like Abel 370 the objects, which are slightly elongated, particularly tell a wealth of information about the cluster. The amplitude of the elongation depends on the position of the sources with respect to the center of the gravitational lens, and their orientation is perpendicular to the gradient of gravitational potential. The use of all these elongated objects permits to reconstruct the gravitational potential of the lensing cluster and allows astronomers to directly map its dark matter distribution. By studying these properties, astronomers and cosmologists have determined that Abel 370 contains two large separate clumps of dark matter, contributing to the evidence that this massive galaxy cluster, five billion light years from Earth, is actually the result of two smaller clusters merging together five billion years ago. During the six cluster observations Abel 370 was part of, Hubble also looked at six parallel fields. These are regions near the galaxy clusters, which were imaged with the same exposure time as the clusters themselves. While one of HSD's cameras looked at the galaxy cluster, another camera simultaneously viewed an adjacent, seemingly sparse, dark patch of sky. This second region, the parallel field, provides a deep look into the early universe without gravitational lensing, but without the light pollution of the bright clusters themselves. Each cluster and its parallel field were imaged for the first six months in either infrared or visible light, depending on which Hubble instrument was applied to it. Then six months later, the cameras effectively swapped places, with each camera now observing the other's previous location. Until the James Webb Space Telescope came online in 2021, the results of the Frontier Fields program, released in 2017, produced the deepest observations ever made of galaxy clusters and the magnified galaxies behind them. These observations are helping astronomers still understand how stars and the galaxies of the early universe emerged out of the Dark Ages at a time after the Big Bang 
and when the cosmic microwave background had cooled and darkened the universe. When space was dark, opaque, and filled with hydrogen. This is an era of the universe still filled with mysteries about the evolution in the infancy and adolescence of the universe we exist within, in an area of research still teeming with new discoveries to be made. It's an exciting frontier of science and an exciting look into just how much we've discovered about the universe. It's about 8.30 in the morning right now, and it's raining out. I don't know how well you guys can hear that, but uh, I think it's a great day to just browse this universe book here. This one's the, it's called the, the Universe, the Definitive Visual Guide. And I just opened this one because this is one of the most impactful um, types of pictures. The deep field, one of Hubble's many deep fields. This one says it's of galaxies from 9 billion, not million or 100 million, but 9 billion light years away. Each one of these, each one of the dots and then the spirals that don't have the diffraction spikes on them are galaxies. Every one that does, even these small ones here, are stars in our own Milky Way. And that's still pretty incredible to think about there. There's not too many of them. We could probably count them. And maybe we will. That's Definitely something that would help me drift off to sleep, I know. But what's also incredible, and what helps me just forget about my daily worries, is remembering that the universe is this expansive, and each one of these galaxies might have life just like us, wondering the exact same thing. And more than likely at, if not extinct, at a much different phase of evolution than us. It says most of these, this is with a infrared, a near infrared filter. And that's the light that is just at a wavelength slightly longer than the reddest light we can see. Infrared is light that... Yeah, here comes the rain again. It's so nice. Setting such a nice mood for browsing through this book right now. Infrared light pierces clouds. That's why the James Webb telescope is... Um, mainly infrared it goes almost goes about halfway through up to the visible um, portion of light that we can see it goes up to about orange yellow but um, the gold reflecting dish of the James Webb telescope is specifically to collect and reflect into the uh, sensors that record the uh, observed data, um, it's specifically meant to collect infrared light. Because infrared is the light that allows us to see furthest into the universe. As galaxies expand, we can see on our uh, space-time diagram of the universe here, As galaxies, as the universe, this is the origin of the Big Bang here. After the Big Bang, there was a massive expansion. 
and then kind of outlined by this light path here. This is our past light cone. We can't see anything beyond this right now. But the light cone as we, the y-axis is time here. We are progressing through time and we're at 14, nearly, nearly 14 billion years right now. The x-axis is distance. And this is proper, proper distance, which includes the expansion of space, the growing actual metric of space that is described by the Einstein field equation. And these are each horizontal line on this graph paper represents the same time. So that's why I have galaxies starting as little baby galaxies, stellar nurseries, evolving over seven, eight, nine, a few billion years into maybe dwarf galaxies that have coalesced around a central black hole and themselves are rotating around a center of mass in their local few million or so light year radial area of space. Later on, a few million, a few billion more light years, they might have merged into a larger galaxy. And so now here, we're here at 14, roughly, again, billion light years since, as far as we can tell, the universe was at a single point. And one of the biggest um, pieces of data that indicate that the universe was at a single point, and it's not just an illusion, is that we see at the furthest reaches, all the way out here, what at 14 billion years now, if we could see that far back in real time what that area of space is doing, the perimeter of our local volume of the universe, which is about 73 billion, or, or 93 billion, sorry, about 93 billion, it's a sphere, 93 billion light years wide. At the perimeter of that sphere, the matter, the material would have already evolved, just like we've evolved out of the hot, haze, distributed, kind of uniformly distributed, uniformly hot haze, and how weak matter eventually clumped what they think around dark matter halos, which kind of gave the structure of the universe, and then it ultimately it cl clumped it to galaxies and clusters and super clusters of galaxies. That material, if we follow this line all the way back, this is material that, that is coming to us after being stretched across a time scale of about 14 billion years. And with the expansion of space, it was probably only about 40 to 100 million light years from us when that first light emitted at an age of about 300,000 light years old, which is very, very early in the universe. But nonetheless, that light, as the matter that that light was emitted from, has expanded away from us if we assume that our location in space hasn't changed. And things, if this graph, if you mirror it, we mirror that on both sides. Or even further, if we extrapolate that into three dimensions, that's a more accurate idea of what's going on in the universe. But all the other material further than 
Mm, about six billion. It's the uh, about six and a half billion light years away. That's the point at which dark energy is starting to accelerate space away from us. These the space between the galaxies. The galaxies themselves are moving through space, but also the vast hundreds of millions and billions of light years between galaxy clusters is also expanding, moving everything outside of our local tiny little few hundred million light year cluster, or really even our few million light year local cluster of galaxies, it's moving it away from us because gravity is not, is uh, at those scales of distance, gravity is overtaken by dark energy. But nonetheless, that's why I guess I brought that out. Because infrared, this is the infrared view, this isn't visible light, it's close to it, but not quite. And uh, all these galaxies are emitted, emitting infrared light as their stars are being born. The most active galaxies with the most star birth are typically are the youngest galaxies. And this little caption here says that the stars in this image and you got to remember when these images are taken they are of such a small pinpoint patch of sky from our vantage point I know one of the I don't know about this one in particular but I know one of the Hubble deep fields to give you an idea is like holding a dime at arm's length anybody who's seen my web video knows I, I said this in the beginning but it's such an astonishing fact all of these galaxies these thousands of galaxies when you look right up the fainter it goes the galaxy density doesn't appear to go down so it just goes and goes on and on there might be 10,000 dots if you really consider the faintest little dots here, are in a dime held at arm's length, about three feet away from your face, holding a tiny coin. That is the entire patch of sky. That tiny little patch of sky holds all of these galaxies. And to give you an idea of how many stars are in the Milky Way, Think about how many diffraction spikes we're seeing here. Those all represent stars in our own galaxy. So looking that far away, we can still see maybe 30 galaxies or stars in our own galaxy in the Milky Way shining through. And I'm not sure if they're able to tell how far these stars are away, but uh, the galaxies generally are able to look at, you're able to look at uh, the fingerprints of what elements are emitting light and by telling how those fingerprints, those patterns of absorption lines or emission lines have shifted along the electromagnetic spectrum 
you can tell how how far the uh, how much space how much expanding space that light has had to have traveled through in order to cause that red shift towards the red end of the spectrum. And so if we know that stars generally, we know the pattern of oxygen, for example, that it points to. This star cluster is 9 billion light years away. It says they stand out tiny young galaxies brimming with stars in the process of formation. Some 9 billion light years away in this picture here are seen in this image taken at near infrared wavelength by the Hubble Space Telescope. It's probably from the early 2000s. They stand out because the energy from the new stars has caused the oxygen in the gas around them it's not the starlight themselves, but the energy, the ultraviolet and beyond ionizing energy, it injects the electrons around the oxygen atoms in the gas clouds surrounding these new stars and pervading the entire galaxy to then emit its own wavelength of light. And that is the light that we are detecting. We're seeing the light from the gas glowing from the hot energy of the stars residing within it, kind of hiding inside them in each of these galaxies here. And it says this phase of star birth is thought to represent an important stage in the formation of galaxies for the most numerous type of galaxy in the universe. And again, this um, I think it's so uh, it's so helpful to really look at the the perspective on the the true scale, the true distance to the universe or throughout the universe to the objects that we can detect, and we're looking at light, and we know it's shifted. And that's what this letter Z denotes. And so we say, using this correlation here, the Hubble parameter is the, it's like a ratio of how much the universe has grown, how much the current universe, how far it has grown, the current distance between objects, divided by the distance the that was between the same objects at the time oftentimes when you're looking in these deep field images billions of years ago and so if the distance between us and you know a galaxy residing at z of 0.5 is currently six and a half billion light years away. We follow the line back, and at seven billion years ago, or yeah, seven billion years ago, or because the universe is 14 billion years roughly, that was about also seven billion years after the Big Bang, just happens to be that point right there. That same universe that's six and a half billion light years away from us now. We can't see that light currently because that light takes time to travel through space and reach us. So the light from a galaxy, it's something at a redshift of 0.5 or 6.5 billion light years away. At 7 billion years ago, that tells us that that galaxy was only 1, 2, 3 less than 4 billion light years away and the light that we're currently seeing is from if we extrapolate that up that line onto our past light cone 
we are currently seeing everything that lies on this past light cone. So that galaxy's path intersects our past light cone at about eight and a half billion light years ago. One, two, three, four. That means we're seeing it as it was when it was four billion light years away. Two and a half billion light years closer to us than it currently is. And that effect gets exaggerated though. Here we have Hubble. The furthest it ever saw was about Z11 at a proper distance of 30 billion light years away. And if we follow that line back just underneath this drawn line right here, that means that it intersects our light cone way back here. And on this graph, because it is blown up to cover the entire age of the current universe up until the present age, we can't see what goes on here because it's all exponential. And as far as 2022, I haven't been keeping up to date with it. Webb was able to see about three or four billion light years past that in just its opening run of deep field images because it also takes tons of other observations from within the Milky Way, looking at exoplanets and other nebulae and star clusters and more nearby galaxies as well. But yeah, these stars, the deepest stars into the universe, the most distant stars go all the way, intersect our light going well um, further than just a billion light years after the universe, after the Big Bang. Something like, you know, just hundreds or even tens. Well, no, not tens, but uh, something like between a hundred and 500 million light years after the Big Bang, which is, you know, still quite young on the scale of a 14 billion year old universe. It's one of the reasons, you know, I'm not a physicist. I went to school for engineering and failed, but, um, I've always had a passion for, well, maybe not quite a passion, because then I probably would have become, became an astronomer. But I've had a ongoing curiosity and you know, a fascination for learning about astronomy in particular and cosmology, because it, to me, it is so, uh, I don't know, humbling. It's a reflection of whatever you know, your concept of God is, it's, it, it's analogous to that. It's the biggest, most expansive, the f longest expanses of time, the largest amounts of energy and space and force and, you know, gravity and just everything. It's the limits, I guess, of time and space. And uh, outside of having metaphysical experiences within your own head, which are certainly possible, it's looking outside on a clear night, away from light pollution. I don't get that experience often. If you go down to the Keys or up in the mountains, you occasionally get it. You just see the multitude of stars, and that is such a close experience to looking at infinity that it just always fills me with a sense of awe in a good way. So that's the deepest largest scales 
of the universe. And we've already been through this in a couple, the past, the macroscopic, the microscopic, uh, <laughs> the macroscopic universe, and then four years later, followed up with the microscopic universe. Skipping general um, factoids and very basic outlines of particle physics. It's incredible, you know, just learning about these things. What fuels, you know, the energy we're tapping into in nuclear reactors, in the atomic bombs. None of us hope will go off in the 21st century. Is these nuclear forces between the nucleons of atoms in the nucleus? Neutrons and protons are called generically nucleons. And the strong force snapping those things together. That, as far as we know, as far as I understand, have been there since they snapped together and bound after the universe cooled off enough in the first couple minutes after the Big Bang. It was this hot explosion and generally the universe as it expanded as gas does when it expands it cools down atoms aren't colliding as frequently they're losing energy and there weren't atoms to begin with there were simply energetic forces and fields they think all four forces the gravity and then the three other fundamental forces the electromagnetism strong and weak forces that govern smaller atomic realm of things those forces eventually peeled off into separate forces as the energy of the universe expanded and settled down then the protons the nucleons the quarks formed it's like everything that forms today's matter popped or coalesced, emerged to take up actual finite volume in space and time out of these fields. And in that sense of time, you can't even really be said to exist in the sense that it is matter or material moving from one place to another over a given span of time because there was no matter there was only energy and light photons so it's interesting to think that the quarks typically three I guess that make up each nucleon, each proton or neutron. And here we can see as, as the type, the characteristic of quarks are arranged in different trinities. They determine whether it's a proton or neutron. And if certain energies are released, a neutron can change into a proton, and vice versa. A neutron can gain a positive charge, electromagnetic charge, upon certain sort of transmutation. Trium deuterium nucleus gamma ray. is one example of that. It's the force that governs radioactive decay. So if you have uranium, it will spontaneously decay 
It'll lose one of its protons or neutrons. Let's see. How does that work? The W plus boson controls the changing of a neutrino into an electron and the transformation of a down quark into an up quark, converting the neutron into a proton. A neutrino interacts. And quantum mechanics is far beyond me because time also Things, I don't understand how they characterize it with math. Because it looks like some of the, the Feynman diagrams explaining the interactions like this have to be analyzed backwards in time, sometimes. The down quark is transformed into an up quark. So instead of having two downs and one up for a neutron, now you have two ups and one down. It's amazing to think that these protons have been bound together for 14 billion years in many cases since the Big Bang. And the matter we're made of has been recycled in stars. It's hard not to uh, think that there is something far deeper going on than we understand with consciousness, with the energy matter exchange throughout the universe. Light is such a weird phenomenon as, you know, I'm using it right now. I mean, I'm using it in many ways. Transmitting electrical signals to a screen that's emitting light for my eyes to um, absorb and interpret. And uh, you guys are listening, electrical signals, which are um, intricately linked with electrons and lights, uh, photons and electromagnetic fields that propagate light through space. And then you're looking at your screen, of course, which is that propagation right into your eye and your stimulating your rods and cones and transmitting more electrical signals to your brain to interpret just all unconsciously what it is that you're watching. My hand, move across the page and the synchronization between the sound in my hand. Somehow able to make sense of these characters and read them. Light, uh, one of the more interesting characteristics of light that I don't quite understand, but if you take relativity to its limit, light, anything traveling at the speed of light, would interpret no lapse, no elapsation, what is it, no, <laughs> no time passing, no matter how far it travels through the universe, light emitted from the beginning of time, 14 billion years ago, in our current paradigm at least, could have traveled across 35, 70, 90 billion light years, taking 14 billion years from our perspective to reach our instruments 
and anything traveling along with that light, if we were to anthropomorphize those light particles traveling that great distance and time, they would experience no lapse in time from their emission to their absorption in our telescopes or our eyes, our rods and cones in our eyes. The universe is an instantaneous, interconnected exchange of light and therefore information and therefore everything's connected. And if you don't see some similarity with that and God and something at least worth following up on, then we are not the same. We are not the same, my friend. I think, uh, I think it might have been Feynman, too, speaking of his diagrams. Him and some other great physicists. They, or maybe it wasn't them, but there is a theory that because of something along the lines of what I just described, every, was it every electron? I'm going to have to look it up real quick. I think every electron, there's a theory, this isn't consensus, mind you, so don't uh, yell at me, but um, that every electron is, there is only one electron, I think it's, the theory might be one electron universe, and every electron is the same electron, because they're not bound by space and time in the sense we know. Oh, John Wheeler. The one electron universe. Wheeler, a, an amazing physicist. Oh, it was Feynman too, okay. The one electron universe postulate proposed by theoretical physicist John Wheeler in a telephone call to Richard Feynman in the spring of 1940 is the p hypothesis that all electrons and their opposites, their antimatter opposites, positrons, are actually manifestations. This is in 1940. Wow. It's before the Manhattan Project. I don't know about Wheeler, but Feynman was definitely an integral part of. Are actually manifestations of a single entity moving backwards and forwards in time. In time not space, moving backwards and forwards in time. Wow. According to Feynman, he said, I received a f telephone call one day at the Graduate College at Princeton from Professor Wheeler in which he said, Feynman, I know why all electrons have the same charge and the same mass. Why? Because they are the same electron. Hmm. A similar, quote, zigzag world line description of perannihilation, end quote. Zigzag world line description of perannihilation has been independently devised by ECG Stuckelberg at the same time. A zigzag world line description of perannihilation. Hmm. The idea is based on world lines traced out across space time by every electron. World line is the three dimensional trajectory through space over a given period of time in that fourth dimension, point A to B in time, provides the line for the fourth dimension, space-time, in space-time. Rather than have myriad such lines, world lines traced out across space-time by every electron, Wheeler suggested that they could all be parts of a single line, like a huge tangled knot traced out by
by the one, the one electron. I don't mean to impose my spiritual inclinations on you guys completely. And I'm not overtly Christian. I was raised in Christian household. My parents are. Live in the States, which Christianity is the dominant religion. But, um, you know, I'm still in the process of learning. You know, that's the nature of this channel, really. But I do have a, whether it's because of my Christian upbringing or not, or maybe my personality temperament, I'm fairly open. I do always have an inclination to try to find deeper meaning in things. Connect ideas. Obviously not rigorously, but uh, it's very hard to read something like that. Proposed by, by consensus, the greatest, some of the greatest physicists of all time. Wheeler, John Wheeler and Richard Feynman. Um, saying that rather than such myriad world lines of many, you know, trillions and trillions and trillions of electrons. They could all be parts of a single line like a huge tangled knot traced out by one electron. Any given moment in time is represented by a slice across space-time that would meet the knot that would meet the knotted line a great many times. Each such meeting point represents a real electron at that moment. At those points, half the lines will be directed forward, and half will have looped around backwards. Wheeler suggested that these backwards sections appear as antiparticles to the electron, the positron. That's so incredible. That's amazing to think about. That's so just, you know, intellectually stimulating, I guess. Or not intellectually, because I'm not doing any intellectual work here. It's just something so interesting to imagine. Many more electrons have been observed than positrons, and electrons are thought to comfortably outnumber positrons. According to Feynman, he raised, he raised this issue with Wheeler, who speculated that the missing positrons might be hidden within protons. Within protons. Feynman was struck by Wheeler's insight that antiparticles could be represented by reverse world lines and credits this to Wheeler, saying in his Nobel speech, he won the Nobel Prize. I did not take the idea that all electrons were the same one from Wheeler as seriously as I took the observation that positrons could simply be represented as electrons going from future to the past in a back section of their world lines. That I stole. Positrons could simply be represented as electrons going from the future to the past in a back section of their world lines of their world lines wow Feynman later proposed this interpretation of the positron as a moving electron backwards in time in his 1949 paper The Theory of Positrons Yuchiro Nambu later applied it, Japanese-American physicist and professor of university at the University of Chicago, and applied it to all production and annihilation of particle-antiparticle pairs, saying that the eventual creation and annihilation of pairs that may occur now and then is no creation nor annihilation, but only a change of directions moving particles from past to future and from future to past. The one 
electron universe. I just tried to swipe the book. Wow. Do you guys ever do that? To try to pinch and zoom <laughs> on the page? Or is that just me? Another interesting little feature of light. Get the microphone back down here. Is uh, how you can have, you know, metal is like, oh, there's so many interesting things about physics and, you know, science when you look into it. And it's way more interesting when you read it discover it on your own and you're not forced to learn it for a test that will dictate your entire future um, red light, blue light, and ultraviolet light these are symbolic, well not symbolic but they are symbolic but they are actually representative of regions on the electromagnetic spectrum let me find where that spectrum was See, that was page. And um, the electromagnetic spectrum, of which a tiny portion of which, I guess is the right way to say it, um, visible light, or on which, a tiny portion, uh, visible light takes up a tiny portion. Where did I put that electromagnetic spectrum? Did I just pass it? No. But, uh, so red light is the longer wavelength than blue light, and those are the ends, the bookends of our visible spectrum. Here it is. There we go. And this is so important because it, it really does dictate our entire lives now that we are surrounded by electronic technology. From longest, and it kind of makes sense that the longest are the peaks travel past any given point, long wavelengths, slowly. If you have propagating waves, you know, like if this is a peak and it travels past this point right here, the interval between peaks is much greater. And so, at a um, given wavelength, the distance for radio waves, it's, or sorry, at a given speed, if the speed is the same, light in a vacuum travels at the same speed, the speed of light, about uh, is it three times 10 to the eight meters per second. I can't tell you how many of you guys corrected me on that on uh, one of my other videos, but uh, the peak, the interval between peaks is going to be much, take much longer traveling at the same speed for intervals that are like radio waves being the longest of the electromagnetic waves from one centimeter, you know, they're, they're in the range of human perceptibility um, in the sense of their their distance. We can't perceive radio waves, but uh, we can comprehend the distance, unlike, you know, billions of a meter between the waves. One centimeter, all the way out to a distance of a kilometer. And so that relates to the, the energies of different kinds of light we look at this, oh, it was literally the next page, oh boy, um, so a low energy photon of red light hits gold foil, and metals, gold in particular, uh, it's really interesting that, you know, we think of atoms as being 
we have an example of just a nucleus surrounded by, if not a solar system model, it's at least a swarm of electrons, a field, probability, yeah, we think of this. But when you have combinations of atoms, especially in metals, that field merges with the field of the surrounding atoms into a entire band, just almost a fluid band of electrons. It's kind of like a river of electrons guided, whose banks are defined by the nuclei that keep them in the structure, rigid, and you have the ability of light, some light, that's why I went into the energy here, the longer wavelength light, as it gets shorter and shorter, we start to label it from radio to microwaves, and then as it gets even shorter, from one, one centimeter down to one millimeter and one hundredth of a millimeter, at that threshold, we start to label it infrared. That's long and then short infrared as infrared itself gets down to one millionth of a meter. And one millionth of a meter is about the threshold for visible light, the longest wavelength that our chemistry, our molecules in our eyeballs can detect and interpret. And, and then we are able to detect things, visible light, that is, ends at about a hundred billionths, billionths of a meter, hundred nanometers. Anything less than about 150, 100 nanometers, anything with a shorter wavelength, higher frequency, we just can't detect. And you don't want to look at, that's what UV light is. It starts being called blue and then violet, ultraviolet. It's beyond, greater than violet. And then that window only exists at a tiny little kind of range between 100 and all the way down to just 10 billionths of a meter or 10 nanometers across between peaks. And so at the same speed, you have billions more peaks crossing a given threshold, a given, you know, sensor at the same speed versus the, you know, meter or 10, 100 meter wide um, distance between peaks of radio waves. So for every given wavelength, if you were to shoot radio waves, radio waves of even a moderate radio emitter, you know, 10 meters, um, yeah, you would have billions less travel and reach that sensor in a given amount of time, you know, five seconds relative to ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet intrinsically, and then it goes to x-rays beyond, um, you know, at, at one billionth of a meter in a tenth of a billionth of a meter, and then gamma rays, that threshold, which is extremely harmful to the body, is any wavelength shorter than a hundred billionth of a nanometer, or, or a meter. These lights of different wavelengths hit the band of electrons, and it's the outer electrons that are most manipulated by being hit by energy, electromagnetic energy called light. And it's really fascinating. This was one of the, the topic of one of Einstein's four um, Annus Mirabilis papers in 1905. It's one of the fewer known papers. He uh, published papers on special relativity and how that would imply the relation or equivalence with a certain 
factor put in there of matter and energy, saying that matter multiplied by a certain number, specifically the speed of light squared, a massive number, that matter is equivalent to this massive amount of energy. This tiny little bit of matter multiplied by a huge number is what the energy contained in that matter equals. And then fast forward 40 years and we Oppenheimer detonated the uh, oversaw the detonation of the first ever atomic bomb I think it was a plutonium core at the Trinity test site in Nevada there and it's so yeah it's just uh, I don't know almost exhilarating to start making connections when you see the light and low energy it is intrinsically, it doesn't matter how dim or how bright you make the light, it could even be a laser if it's uh, attuned to a specific wavelength. That light, I don't care if it's a thousand watt light bulb, as long as it's specifically only emitting red light and not any greater frequencies, it will not stimulate any electric current or flow of electrons in that gold foil, that sea, that river of kind of connected electrons in the lattice of the gold, you know, gold uh, material, the gold structure. But if you change that light, that light bulb, to a blue light bulb, we see it, the energy shifts, it gets slightly higher, and it's this threshold right around the blue, violet, and then ultraviolet, that is the threshold for what, for a radi uh, what we call ionizing radiation. Ionizing means that it ejects electrons from the outer perimeter of, of the outer shells. The outermost electrons are moved. They're manipulated. They are, you know, uh, kind of pushed, which stimulates a current, which is what current is, which is why it's an interesting or useful analogy that, you know, billions of trillions of gold atoms in a sheet of gold, a thin sheet of gold, can be thought to have a river of electrons, across which when you stimulate it with a high enough frequency of light, remember, red is too low, uh, the wavelengths are too far apart, the energy, the, the frequency is too low, and therefore the energy is too low. The photons emitted from that red light, the photons, the red light photons, I should say, are not energetic enough. doesn't matter if one or a billion hit the atoms, the gold atoms, the electrons surrounding those gold atoms at once. They are not energetic enough to knock the electrons out of their shells and initiate a current flowing through that river of gold atoms. However, just slightly higher, a frequency slightly higher, a wavelength slightly shorter, instead of around seven or six hundred nanometers, you go down to maybe two or three hundred or maybe a hundred nanometers. And then now, the photons have an intrinsic energy within them. And this is what's interesting about photons. Photons carry these packets, these, these uh, quanta carry their own intrinsic energy. Blue photons, individual photon packets, carry more energy than red photons, which carry more energy than infrared photons, which carry more energy than microwaves, and it goes in decreasing energy levels all the way out to radio waves. Conversely, the energy is increased every photon from each one of these 
ranges of the electromagnetic spectrum carries with it more and more energy. And if you go all the way up here, ultraviolet light, represented here by white because we can't detect ultraviolet, and they should have put a little, I guess they kind of did put a little purple hue to it, to its trails there, is going to stimulate even more energy emission. And that's pure ultraviolet light. And then X-ray and gamma ray would, they are so powerful at a certain point, mainly the high x-rays or hard x-rays they're called, the weaker x-rays are called and soft x-rays. And the gamma rays, those are so powerful, so ionizing, that they, so energetic, that they actually penetrate through the electrons and hit the nuclei. And they can rip apart nuclei themselves, which, you know, destroy atoms, um, can completely change atoms, and if you are a biological creature, that's why X-rays and nuclei, um, sorry, gamma rays, can have an incredibly damaging effect, killing you in days with a high enough dose, such as from a engineered core of plutonium taken pushed up to the point of near criticality as in the demon core which I will be doing a video of pretty soon <laughs> I keep teasing it but it is coming out because that is an incredibly interesting um, incident Yeah, just little factoids like that make learning about science so cool. And knowing that that same process, that electron stimulation, is what's going on in the stars. They're emitting these hard, you know, X-rays, gamma rays, and lots of visible lots of infrared and visible, they're, they're emitting light all along the electromagnetic spectrum, but they're emitting enough within this portion, this ionizing portion, that is stimulating literally current, making things glow the way your fluorescent light bulbs glow. The same physics is happening there, making clouds glow, nebulae glow. Um, and that's what we can see. That's how we can see galaxies extremely far away using the infrared technologies of telescopes like Hubble and uh, in the James Webb now. So we have space and time, but I am not, I'm not, uh, prepared enough to even try an explanation of relativity right now, because that really broke my brain when I tried to understand it. But again, like the electron and the, um, the photon traveling at the speed of light, essentially time and space get distorted. Things become contracted time extends, it dilates, the faster you move, and with general relativity, the closer you are to a gravitational source. I mean, just generally we, you can see a light. This is greatly, greatly exaggerated. This would be more like if we were near the sun, maybe the light beam would get pulled down, you know, a fraction of a billionth of a meter. But if you were using a very precisely pinpoint um, laser, you might be able to detect it. Or also if you're looking at Earth through an eclipse, you might also be able to see 
a distant star. The light appear to be over here. When in reality it's behind and its light is being curved. That's how they confirmed Einstein's theory of special relativity and or was it general that they confirmed? They confirmed the, the legitimacy of it by measuring the variation, how starlight was in 1919, so about four years after general relativity was published, which uh, wasn't so simple. It took 10 years of trial and error and getting, getting it wrong many, many times before he, and with a lot of help, apparently, before Einstein was able to get the math right. And it is, for me, very, very intense math. I think there's something like 10 or 11 equations that have to be considered to understand space-time dynamics um, between gravity and space-time. Someone went out, though. Someone went out and went to a location. Speaking of the eclipse, um, I hope you guys are able to see it. I'm not, but someone went to a... I think it's coming in late April. So go out and definitely get outside, even if you're only in partial totality. It's very eerie how everything looks more dim. And apparently... I'd like to do maybe a little video on it too. Maybe describe just the, you know, light, basic trigonometry of it or something. But apparently your rods and cones, well I know this is true, but um, apparently it's true even at just moderate stimulation. At night, your the part of your v vision, chemicals that allow vision, they actually aren't activated, so it's hard to kind of tell, but if you're ever in a very dim, you know, at night and dusk, it's getting darker and darker. You'll notice the color start to drain out of everything. It's because your eyes are, they don't need to represent color at a low enough light, um, a low enough level of light. They only need to represent objects and black and white is sufficient to do that and so if you're in a place with a very dim light or deep into dusk in the evening or morning you'll notice you can't very detect color very well and it's interesting I never noticed that but uh, you know I have a small night light in my bathroom and we have or we had pink floor mats at one point or maybe they were green Whatever my wife picked out. Thanks, Molly. They were, I clearly loved them. But uh, I remember being in the bathroom in the middle of the night, and just after I learned that, I was like, oh, yeah, let me look at this pink floor mat. And I was blown away by the fact that I could not detect what color it was, even though I knew it was pink, or I knew what color it was at the time, I promise. And, uh, yeah, it's really cool. So get something that whose color is pretty strong that you know ahead of time. And, uh, yeah, go in a room and turn, like, a small light on that is just enough to barely see something. You know, it's got to be real, real, real dim. And you'll notice all the color gets sapped out of it. And apparently that effect also happens during a solar eclipse. So yeah, I'd like to do a video about that too. By the way guys, I just was thinking about solar eclipse and all the other videos I watched like from, um, what is it called? Uh, 
What is this channel called? I always know Veritasium because it's so unique, but smarter every day. That guy is also, he, uh, his video, Huck and Mika on my Discord shared that with me. And um, I watched it because that guy's so good at presenting science in a very accessible way. And that made me think of YouTube and what, and how I'm subscribed to different channels. And it really does help to, uh, I guess, engage with you guys to remind you to subscribe and, and like my content if you enjoyed it. So if you, uh, if you do genuinely like this, give it a like. It does help YouTube know that you liked it and that people liked it and to show it to more people because I guess that's a pretty good indication that people like it. And if you really like it, go ahead and subscribe if you already have. But um, that's only if you do. So something else, I guess, that it's really... Yeah, it's just, uh, it's unique, it's bizarre to think about. Is that there's these filaments of dark matter I kind of alluded to earlier. And they are the structure for the whole universe. Apparently, let's make sure we're in frame here. Apparently, in the first few minutes, or at least few thousand years, which is almost indistinguishable on a cosmic scale of billions of years, there was these filaments, there is um, dark matter. We still don't know what it is, what it was, but it is somehow not very reactive with gravity. It's not very, or no, excuse me, it is it is and has gravity and is reactive to it because it forms around galaxies, most galaxies at least, that we know and we have measured. Um, we looked at the starlight we can see and accounted for any invisible gas or extra planets and stars that might be invisible to us. And for some reason, the mass and the dynamics of almost every single galaxy with the only with the exception of only I think a handful have indicated that there is about 10 times more gravity manipulating constraining and confining those stars in each galaxy than the detectable matter the detectable starlight nebulae you know even the accounting for black holes at the centers of galaxies. And so we think there is this dark matter, this material whose nature is dark to dark to us. We just that's why it's dark. We do not know much about it, but we know it pervades the universe, but not randomly. It's dark also because it doesn't react with light. It doesn't give off light so we can't see it, but it also lets light through it. It's like inert to light. Light actually, in the same way it knocks electrons, that imparts a force on an object. That's why comets can actually be altered. Their course, their trajectory can be altered by passing close to sun. And uh, Mark Zuckerberg and others are planning this Project Starshot where they have a very, very, very m massive solar sail, but it's very thin and the material is incredibly light. And we're gonna hit it with lasers because lasers are very precise, travel a far distance, and they pack the biggest punch. Um, per unit area. They're the most intense. And um, anyways, that is called radiation pressure. 
what he's going to do, what they're going to do with that, that project, is send the solar sails outside the solar system, I believe, to Proxima Centauri, just outside to get as far and as, and as quickly as possible to possibly send data back and let us know what's outside our heliosphere, our protective bubble. Um, and they're using radiation pressure from lasers directed, power, powerful lasers, directed right at these sails, and they're going to accelerate them because there are no humans on them as fast as they can. And with enough pressure, radiation pressure, over enough time, they can accelerate them to speeds approximating at a significant fraction, fraction of, at least, the speed of light get them going so you know they will get there within a few hundred years i think maybe anyways dark matter going back to dark matter here dark matter it is not affected by radiation pressure and in the be beginning in the beginning carrying out my spiritual my religious theme inclinations here i guess um, in the Big Bang, the first couple, 300,000 years, there were, it was just a field, it was basically like, just a large sun, not a, not a sun, but a large uniform field of glowing, extremely hot gas, plasma, very hot gas, and the radiation pressure from that on all the other atoms internally or even, you know, once atoms had formed was immense. It didn't let anything collapse and gravitationally uh, form the first seeds of the first galaxies. Because that's what has to happen to form a galaxy. There has to be some pocket that is just slightly more dense than the others around it and then that creates a center of gravity towards which an accumulative effect a, a a runaway what's it called a Pareto distribution of matter occurs where one area all it takes is to have the initial mover the initial movement the initial seed of a galaxy collapse and that just attracts all the it, it gives direction I guess you could say well while ordinary matter like atoms were still being ricocheted and prevented from collapsing and, and forming these seeds of galaxies dark matter because it is so inert, so unreactive to radiation, light, radiation pressure, it was able to collapse. And so, even amid this sea of bright, glowing, hot, energetic plasma of matter and the photons that it's releasing back and forth, the dark matter is basically undeterred. It's basically unmoved by, um, it's not spread out. It's not continually buffeted in, you know, any pockets. Like normal matter, any pockets that would have formed densely would have been blasted and would have just been buffeted away and prevented from collapsing. And so dark matter is able to form these filaments early, early in the universe. It co coalesces on itself. And this is representative of regions, let's see, 140 million light years. So this isn't some small area here. This is 140 light years a square on a side. 140 million, sorry. So each one of these dots are clusters of galaxies. And these knots
No, so each one of these knots are actually super clusters. You're not even able on this scale to make out individual clusters of galaxies. Everything here are super clusters and connections of super clusters form this network. This eerily, this network of these filaments of galaxy superclusters that on these scales of 100, 3, 4, 500 million light years across and on, on beyond that, on the order of billions of light years, eerily starts to look like networks of neurons inside the human brain. And it's along this dark matter, again, this phenomena, this matter, this phenomena, and that's separate from dark energy, the repulsive energy that itself is dark, we don't know the nature of as well, but it's separate, it's a distinct phenomena in the universe from that. We do not know what dark matter is and why it attracts galaxies and why it wasn't affected, why it isn't affected by light. Like what with all our technology, what the hell could dark matter be that it is undetectable still? Even with our, presumably, in our own galaxy that we live within, we are surrounded by a halo of dark matter. So the only known life in the cosmos as of now is on Earth. It's the only known life. And think about how that's gonna drastically alter our perception of ourselves in the universe. Because that means if we ever find new life, it's going to change how rare we view life as. This is a general walkthrough of the Drake equation that takes percentages of the key variables in a kind of mathematics, it's like a pseudo-mathematical take on how to, how to view the probability of life in the universe. We look at the rates of star births, we think how many there might be, and star birth and, and the placement of, um, you know, where a star is in its life also dictates how habitable planets around that star could be because early stars, young stars, are, you know, still have a lot of debris, therefore a lot of comet impacts disrupting any potential evolution of life. So it's not very stable. You need to be have an older star whose space debris out of its stellar disk has mostly been, you know, sucked up, cleared up by planets. And in our unique situation, which I think it's turning out to look like our solar system is incredibly unique because we have Jupiter, we have all these gas giants, these massive planets out there, but mostly Jupiter is the key player in corralling and absorbing and attracting major comets, major potential hazards to life on Earth. Away from us, it absorbs the impact. It's kind of like a shepherd for our little oasis in the inner solar system. So you need a lot of special circumstances to allow for an uninterrupted evolution of life, you need, you need planets 
We think there's a lot of planets. We've found thousands, thousands more since this book was published. Even though this is the updated version, so... I don't know. When was it published in, uh... When was it revised? Still, that's 12 years ago. We've found tens of thousands more planets since this book was written, so that's incredible to think about. Then you need planets with life, so habitable. You need planets. I guess if we're starting from the beginning, you need stars at a sort of a certain age. You need certain so that planets can form without being constantly bombarded. You need planets of a certain chemical makeup to allow for life. You need them, need them to be at specific distances, not too hot in the Goldilocks zone, not too far away where it's all ice. You need them to not have too many, so they're not constantly, so they have stable orbits. So they're, um, you know, they have stable day-night cycles. They don't have too much variability. Or else it might be harder for life to adapt. The climates might be too erratic if the orbits and the, the moons and, you know, are too unstable. You need life. You need intelligence once life develops, which took, as far as we know, took our planet four billion years to develop intelligence. Then you need communicating technologically advanced life. You need a civilization that can allow for the development of that, so you're not just trying to survive, but you actually have enough free time and resources to have at least a portion of your population develop technology to be able to transmit signals which then we can hear so using the estimates estimates above one might expect there to be about 50 times 0 0.5 0 0.4 0 0.9 0 0.1 0 0.1 so a 50 percent star burn 0.5% uh, uh, stars with planets. 0.4 will be habitable. 90%, 0.9 of habitable planets develop life. 10% of life, no, 90% of life bearing planets bear only simple life. So 10%, 0.1 has intelligent life. 90% of intelligent life never talks to the stars. Hmm. I wonder why that is. Whether it's technological or just philosophical reasoning there. And then, um, lifespan. civilizations might actually last. On average, they expect <laughs> some civilizations die before they can even ever be contacted back. So they might emit radio signals. But they might be dead at the time we received those signals or they might have stopped transmitting those signals due to some sort of extinction whether by their own hand in weaponry and war or by external issues like you know super volcanoes or some dramatic event like a comet impact or even 
their star exploding, wiping them out. And these, these values for all these variables here yield 900 civilizations in our own galaxy today. Just 900 out of something like 100 billion stars. 900, that's it. And given our, our galaxy is, you know, on the order of 200,000 light years across, those could easily be so far spread out, so far away from us, that we, we would take, you know, tens, at least tens of thousands of years to ever reach them by any sort of spacecraft. I don't even know if, if that would include a manned spacecraft. That might just be the limitations of our own technology, so. That is, though, with our, those values for those variables input into that equation, and we're not even sure if that's all the variables they are sufficient, or if those values are correct. So there could be a hundred thousand, you know, given that there's a hundred billion stars, there could be a hundred thousand civilizations out there. It could be that we are the only civilization out there in the Milky Way at the moment. We don't know. And it could be that if we look far enough into the past, into the distant cosmos, billions of light years away, the universe is of such a geometric shape, a closed universe, a universe that curves in four-dimensional space-time in on itself that we are actually looking back at a region of the universe in which we exist, at a early Milky Way galaxy. And I guess we'd never really have any way of telling because if we look far enough out, it's far enough back in time that even if we were to try to map on the Andromeda and our galaxy, and some of the Triangulum and some of the dwarf galaxies around it, they would look so different. They would be so much younger. They wouldn't be the same shape, have the same general, you know, illumination um, patterns of, of um, emission lines, characteristic, el el you know, combinations of elements being emitted by the stars within them. They wouldn't even have the same mass, so we wouldn't be able to tell if maybe some of these galaxies that we're looking at out here on the perimeter, 30, 40 billion light years away, are just ourselves, and not ourselves, but our galaxy. 12, 13 billion light years ago, no, billion years, 40 billion light years away. So those are just some things to think about, to distract you from whatever daily worries and pressures and stresses you guys have, because I know I sure have a couple. But this helps remind me that the universe is far more than school and work and bills and war. It's a vast territory that we can uncover generation by generation. A, uh, an island of knowledge that we can recover, gain a little more, and expand a little more with each experiment and observation, 
with each you know, an island of wisdom on top of that, or maybe underneath it, who knows, that we can also expand with more and more interactions taken from a place of humility. Wouldn't that be cool? If you guys like this, yeah, again, subscribe and, you know, like, give me a comment. I love talking to you guys. Sometimes I don't get around to it. I'm so darn busy, but um, I really do enjoy hearing from you guys. So Let me know what you liked, what you didn't, and what you want to see in the future. Thanks for watching, and uh, we'll see you in the next couple episodes. The Demon Core. I got one about World War II coming up. And I'll probably have to make something about that an eclipse coming up in February or April. I mean. Oh, no. It's this one. <laughs>